During the 1960s and 70s, Francis Schaeffer wrote two dozen books, many of them bestsellers, about the relevance of biblical Christianity in a troubled world. He and his wife, Edith, embraced a searching generation at Labrie, their study center and home in Switzerland. Through two powerful film series, Schaefer showed what could happen in a society when people abandon belief in God and embrace a philosophy centered in themselves. He has been called one of the most influential Christian leaders of the 20th century. Join us on this day of discovery for the story of Francis and Edith Schaefer, two people who made a difference. Francis Schaefer was a student here at Germantown High School in Philadelphia. He would have been the last person to suspect what lay ahead for him. He didn't even know that Edith Seville, the girl he would marry, lived right down the road. And years later, Edith would call their lives a tapestry that only God could weave. Born on January 30, 1912, Francis was the only child of Frank and Bessie Schaefer. His parents wanted him to get an education and a good job working with his hands. You have to think of the story of his life, growing up with um, my dear grandparents who are sort of the typical first generation people working hard. My grandmother had her high school education, my grandfather only a third grade education. And they worked hard for this one child to give him good clothes, live in a good house, wanted things to work out for him. Half a world away, on November 3rd, 1914, Edith Seville became the third daughter born to her missionary parents in China. When Edith was five, her family returned to America and eventually settled in Philadelphia when she was a teenager. She had the academic uh, scholarly background which my father had lacked and also the huge Christian heritage. So my grandparents were missionaries on my mother's side, the Seville's, and she'd been born in China, had a passion for missionary work all her life with a special love of anyone Asian and especially Chinese. As a student at Germantown High School, Francis Schaefer was not planning to attend college. In order to please his father, he followed a plan of practical courses such as mechanical drawing, woodworking, and metal shop. After graduation, he enrolled at Drexel Institute to study engineering. But another force was at work within him that would change the direction of his life. He had started reading Greek myths. He had started reading Greek philosophy. And he had come up with what he called later in a lecture, the basic philosophic questions. Where do we come from? Who are we? Uh, is there any purpose to existence? What is the origin of evil? Uh, is there life after death? And he started thinking about these things and reading. Uh, then he said to himself, I don't believe the Bible. I've been to this liberal church. I haven't heard anything. He always said his father, who was a janitor, said when the pastor closed the Bible, after the reading and said, thus endeth the lesson, that that was the truest thing he ever said because <laughs> there wasn't any lesson later. Um, so out of this background, he had discarded the Bible, but at a certain point, he thought to himself that it was dishonest to discard the Bible without having read it. So he took a whole year, read it from cover to cover, and at the end of it, as he always said, he realized that all the philosophic questions he had 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 been answered. In 1931, he entered hampton Sydney College near Richmond, Virginia to study for the Christian ministry. Although Schaefer found the Southern culture at hampton Sydney much different than Philadelphia, he plunged into college life with great zest. 
He joined the Ministerial Association, the Literary Society, and took part in the Student Christian Association. The student body of Hamden, Sydney, at the time Dr. Schaefer entered in 1931, numbered about 300 with a faculty of roughly 20. The, the teaching of the members of the faculty at that time was um, extraordinarily strong. And the, um, uh, their personal relations with, with the students uh, gave them uh, an impact, uh, an influence on these young men that it's, it's hard to repeat nowadays. In the summer of 1932, Francis and Edith met at a church group in Germantown when they both spoke out to defend the truth of the Bible. Fran had said to the boy next to him, who in the world's that girl? I didn't know there was anybody in this church that knew things like that. And he said, oh, that's Edith Seville. And meantime, I was saying to the girl next to me, who on earth's that boy? I didn't know there was anybody in this church that was a Christian. The girl next to me said, oh, that's Francis Schaefer. And we met, bang, in the middle of the room. And he said, may I take you home? Like that. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, I already have a date. Uh, there's a boy taking me home. And he said, well, break it. That was his first word to me. <laughs> but they were not his last words to Edith. A friendship quickly developed that soon blossomed into love. It continued to grow through their letters while he was away at college. In the midst of very busy schedules, they always found time to write. He was uh, president of uh, what is now would be called a pre-ministerial association, the League of Evangelical Students, which was a very potent uh, organization in those days. He also had to learn, I mean, any boy coming here, uh, and we would, uh, in, in those days especially, with such a small student body, would have to learn to get along with, as the prayer book says, all sorts and conditions of men. He uh, uh, would have to have uh, learned to get along with, with boys that were not exactly hostile to uh, his way of thinking, but uh, certainly not um, exactly amenable to it. Dormitory life in any college uh, is, um, is a testing ground for character in many ways. Uh, that's where uh, uh, students learn to really get along with one another. Great emphasis in, the, in college life on athletics, as now, on social things, the sort of thing that Dr. Schaefer and some of his friends were opposed to, such as dancing, card playing, typical college boy pursuits, uh, and of course much of it lubricated by what was still illegal alcohol. Even during Prohibition, bootleg liquor and local moonshine were easy for the students to obtain. Many Saturday nights, Schaefer's dorm mates staggered back to Cushing Hall and shouted out his name. He helped them find their rooms and got them into bed, but the next morning, he woke them up and took them to the college chapel. You see, it was part of their deal. He agreed to help them when they were drunk, and they agreed to go to church with him. So I think his life in Cushing Hall as, as, as a student uh, would have been a testing ground for him. Uh, he had to learn to give and take and uh, uh, I'm sure that, he, on the other hand, that he influenced for the good many of his fellows that were there. Everyone respected Francis Schaefer, even as a student. He was a guy that was looked on as solid. He was a good, quiet presence in a, in a community that could use that kind of presence. While Fran attended Hampton Sydney College, Edith commuted each day from her parents' home in Germantown to Beaver Women's College, just north of Philadelphia. Here she pursued a Bachelor of Science degree in home economics, 
combining the artistic foundation of clothing design and home decoration with practical courses in household management and nutrition. It was a field Edith loved and in which she excelled, but she chose to leave school a year short of her degree to marry Francis Schaeffer in the summer of 1935. Following their wedding and a summer job as camp counselors in Michigan, they rented a third floor rear apartment near the Philadelphia Art Museum. Fran entered Westminster Seminary where he thrived on his classes with Dr. Gresham Machen, Alan McRae, and Cornelius Van Til. While Fran studied, Edith made dresses at home to supplement their Depression-era income. It was a grand adventure for them both. But within the denomination, the seeds of theological disagreement were about to yield a harvest of conflict and separation. The issues that Dr. Machen fought for were the basic issues of the truth of the Bible and the truth of the Christian faith and the reality of salvation. Dr. Machen was tried and, and, and uh, was condemned because he held for the basic fundamentals of the Christian faith. It was an, a time when the heart of the gospel was being attacked and uh, many of us felt, and Dr. Machen himself, I believe, felt, that we should keep our emphases on the major fundamentals of the faith. Francis Schaeffer, uh, was, when he uh, started in on something, he was all out. And when we started Faith Seminary, he took an active part, though he was a, a student. Vernon Grounds, who entered Faith Seminary in 1937, described the atmosphere as intense. We were being trained to move out into an apostate Christendom and be a corrective force. Carl McIntyre, who lived and pastored in Collingswood, New Jersey, would come to Wilmington, Delaware at least once a week. And in chapel, he would speak about the latest developments of apostasy. And of course, he was a very forceful, dynamic, and sold out individual and made all of us feel that this was God's calling, that we too should be spearheading the 20th century Reformation. In May 1938, Franz Schaefer graduated from Faith Seminary and was ordained as a minister in the Bible Presbyterian Church. We had no great vision of anything. We, we really believed what we... Uh, both believed thoroughly that uh, God is our Father and that He would unfold what He wanted us to do. Where were we going to go? We had no idea. So when we went to Grove City, Pennsylvania, after seminary, um, Bran was called to a little church there. It seemed so unromantic, <laughs> so very different from what we had pictured. My grandfather, George Howe, he uh, owned a coffee company. And um, when the Schaefers were ready to move here, uh, he sent a small fleet of his trucks to Philadelphia to move Frances and Edith and their first child, I think was, uh, I believe it was Priscilla, back to Grove City in one of these uh, coffee trucks. My grandfather was uh, one of six elders who uh, were very dissatisfied with the teachings in the church they were in. They decided um, to start another church. They felt the one they were in was too um, filled with modernism, as they called it in those days, which I think today they would call liberalism. It was a very small number of people meeting in the American Legion Hall. We had to clean it up after the dance that they'd had the night before, before church started. And I had this, this uh, baby with me and had to be encouraging to my husband by sitting in a front seat. <laughs> it was not an idyllic time. The congregation of the Covenant Presbyterian Church, 18 adults and no children, met upstairs in the American Legion Hall. And next door was a small apartment where the Schaefers lived. 
It was a humble beginning, but the enthusiastic young pastor certainly didn't confine himself to four walls and to preaching only on Sunday morning and evening. Reverend Schaefer was interested in going out and bringing them in from the byways and highways from the country, many children that didn't have even a church affiliation. And of course, this was the first Bible school was in the American Legion Hall until the church was built. Summer Bible School was very new to our area. Um, in fact, the ones that I knew had never heard of it, but he was delighted that he could start a Bible school in Grove City. He we went around and got these boys and then had a wiener roast. And he did this, I don't remember how often, maybe once a week or so, but he got them, and then he sent them out to scouts out to get more of their friends, and he was a builder. He went up and down the street, and they would tell him where a boy lived. And then he'd, he'd, have to, he'd have to go to the door and invite them <laughs> to come to get them interested in social life and then get them into the church. Yes, and I think, I really think this was the first Bible school in Grove City that he started that. People were amazed at the turnout and the results. Schaefer took a group photograph in this football stadium where there was room enough for everyone. At the closing exercises, Parents watched proudly as their children recited the books of the Bible, quoted entire psalms from memory, and sang with great enthusiasm. I first met Francis Schaefer when I was about 10 years old. They were having daily vacation Bible school, and my aunt was a member of the church, and she and Letha Timlin uh, took us to Bible school. I spoke with a friend of mine who was in Bible school at the time, and um, she told me that she remembered him starting teams for the young boys, and uh, she said he was more like one of the boys. He was about the same size in stature and um, very youthful looking, and it would be probably difficult for people to know which was one of the kids and which was Francis Schaefer. But in spite of his youthful appearance, the 28-year-old Schaefer was considered a leader in his denomination, as well as being a very capable and innovative young pastor. My mother um, was also a member of that church and uh, was there when Francis Schaefer came. And uh, she said that he would not ask you if you would do something. She said he would tell you we're going to do it. But she said what that promoted in the church was a, sort of a unified spirit and a real teamwork because everybody was involved um, in, in being part of the church. On Sunday evenings he invited the young people of the congregation and anyone that was welcome to attend for a Bible study in their apartment. I'm sure they were on a very limited income, but she always had some refreshments for us. And one was rich crackers with peanut butter and marshmallow whip. <laughs> the influence that Reverend Schaefer had on my parents' life was really tremendous because Prior to his ministry here, they really didn't have a Christian home. When Reverend Schaefer uh, would come around to the house and uh, he would actually lead you in the steps for devotion, showing you how and what you should do, reading the Bible and explaining the verses and uh, in praying. He treated this small covenant church like a big city church. She said he had seminars, he had conferences, he had retreats, he had guest speakers. And she said he was never worried about numbers. All he ever worried about was um, saving souls. And uh, it wasn't long um, before he was really in demand as a preacher. He, he um, we knew we wouldn't keep him here. They, they, she said we knew we couldn't keep him. In 1941, after three years in Grove City, the Schaefers moved to Chester, Pennsylvania, where Fran became associate pastor of the Bible Presbyterian Church under Dr. Abraham Latham. Fran continued his work with children, including summer camps and Bible school. But he felt too much of his time was required to supervise the church's new construction. After a call came from a church in St. Louis, he and Edith wrestled with the decision and finally decided to accept. But before leaving, Fran personally visited every member of the congregation to say goodbye. Francis Schaefer's legacy in Chester was much more than a building. The friendships and relationships he and Edith established here would endure as their greatest contribution. 
A few months after Francis Schaeffer arrived as pastor, the Bible Presbyterian Church on North Union Street overflowed during the summer Bible school. A St. Louis newspaper devoted an entire page to this unique outreach that drew 700 children from all over the city. We were about fourth or fifth grade when summer Bible school began. And uh, it was the first one in the metropolitan St. Louis area when Francis Schaefer was pastor here. So it went all over the metropolitan area. You know, there were buses and people coming from all over the place. Well, I guess the, the thing I remember most is um, how much the Schaefers got the kids involved. Teaching us the books of the Bible, they would lead up in front and we would all sort of chant out the books of the Bible and it, it, they would want us to get louder and, and it was, you know, for a kid in church to be as loud as possible, <laughs> that was a real treat. It was just very exciting. Uh, the Schaefer just made it very exciting. And for kids, you know, 10-year-old, that was, church had not always been like that. <laughs> so it was fun. In the morning, we had all sorts of classes and uh, very, very rigorous, really. Great deal of memorization. But it was a summer Bible school from, uh, from the kindergarten, I believe, right on up through high school. We did reams of scripture. I remember we memorized, uh, well, one passage of 1 Corinthians 15, the entire passage the entire chapter. But it had a big impact, a big impact. Matter of fact, a lot of the scriptures that I remember today are all from that summer Bible school. Yeah. Fran Schaefer had great, great, great ideas and great, great, great letters that he wrote. And he really put his whole heart in everything he did. Well, he is a very practical man, a very energetic man, and a very, uh, determined man. Uh, when he went about to do something, he uh, really uh, set about doing it. We had uh, Children for Christ classes and Empire Builders for boys and girls, and he just uh, put his whole energy into those programs. Hurrying in and hurrying out. <laughs> he was, that's what he was. And sticking, writing things down, sticking them in his pocket. That, that's what, I, and he was f always nice and fun. And uh, but very businesslike. E Edith, oh, she was fun. <laughs> she really was. Only sometimes she'd want to call and visit, and he'd want to be working at the work, and he'd uh, say, uh, "Hang it up." And I, I say, "No, because she's not finished with the story." I didn't care. <laughs> A couple times he he just did it himself. But he, he did it nicely. He was always nice about it. But he, she, she was lots of fun. She really was. I've heard him tell how she would, they'd be working away and get, they'd be a little bit late and they'd get off to church in the Sunday morning and either was still combing her hair. <laughs> I think it was just part of her creativity that she was not a scheduled person. And uh, uh, it would have really, um, hampered her, I think, if she had been uh, scheduled, but her uh, sort of doing things at the last minute, doing things quickly, those were things I remember. Uh, that was true for Francis Schaeffer also in terms not only of his preaching, which could go along. Oh, he didn't have any difficulty articulating. <laughs> he could talk all right. <laughs> all was good. <laughs> the question was to turn him off. <laughs> I don't know what they would have been without each other. My mother very different, my father terribly organized, my mother artistic, thinking of the people, the setting, making love homes which were welcoming, food that went with it, sewing, ironing, being a good neighbor, and um, very much involved in the teamwork. She backed up my father, always working together right the way through in St. Louis when he was a pastor there. Well, on his days off, which was Monday, he'd always take us children to the art museum. We lived in that art museum. And he had all kinds of games for us in the museum. And, and when we'd finish playing these games, looking, he'd say, look for this and look for that. And then he'd say, now, never mind which of the great paintings, which one would you like to have in your bedroom? Choose. Ask questions and look and read and uh, have no fear, no fear of what you're going to find. 
a real appreciation for art and music and books and people and all their creativity and all their thinking. I think that was my father's greatest gift to me. At the request of his mission board, Franz Schaefer spent the summer of 1947 surveying the condition of churches in Europe after World War II. The experience marked a turning point in his life. He fell in love with Europe, and the mission board asked him to return to Europe under the board to keep contact and started children's work in war-torn Europe in the churches already established. So after much thought and prayer, he did. The entire Schaefer family loved the city of St. Louis. Their home was only a few blocks from Forest Park. The girls were happy, and Edith felt this was a place where they could put down roots and stay. And they loved the people in the church, and the growing congregation loved them. But the post-war trip to Europe had opened Fran's eyes to a new world of opportunity and need. And gradually it became clear that God had called them to a new place. But they could not imagine what he had in store for them in the years to come. Join us next week from Switzerland for the story of Labrie, another chapter in the biography of Francis and Edith Schaefer.